Everybody give a warm welcome to Jody Weiss for the Leadership Factory podcast. How are you doing, Mr. Jody? I'm doing great, Greg. Thanks for having me on today. Hey, buddy, you're the first second timer on the Leadership Factory podcast. I know yeah. you're feeling good about that. I feel honored or else you're just running out of friends to uh, to speak with you <laughs> on these podcasts. But no, I thought we had a really good conversation the last time. So I'm happy we can talk about something else, maybe go a little deeper into some areas of how you we've worked with people over our careers to try to bring the best out of them. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, because the name of your last episode was I Believe in People. So and that's pretty hard to, you know, your FBI, uh, chief of police in Chicago. So when you believe in people, you see the worst in people. See, that was the irony of the name of your title, knowing what you've been through and all the horrible things that you've seen and had to manage through to say, I believe in people. Because you see the best in people, even though you've seen the worst of the worst people. Yeah, that's true. That's right. true. There's always good in somebody. You can always, I mean, few people are just pure evil. I mean, are that's there exactly. 100%. But usually some people just have made bad choices. And if there's a way that you can somehow maybe change their behavior, uh, influence them in such a way to maybe be help them down a different path. I think that's really important. So um, try to do so, that. Just to set the premise of today, the premise of our Leadership Factory podcast, a leader is a person who can inspire another person to take a journey that they're just not going to take by themselves. How do you do that? How do you do that? That's what the whole premise of this Leadership Factory podcast. We want to develop and grow in our factory inspirational leaders who can go out to their families, their companies, and their communities and inspire people to do the right things instead of someone inspiring them to do the wrong things. Because they're be people are being inspired one way or the other. We just got to get more people on the good side. Agreed. So I'll, since we've known each other, you – you would always tell me about when you were the chief of police that you would get in your car with your driver at one or two o'clock in the morning and you would drive to not so good part of Chicago and sit and have coffee in a diner and build relationships with people. So when you're telling me that story, I'm sitting there going, this guy's crazy. This guy, what, what provoked you to do that? You know, what brought me to Chicago, my predecessor was a great crime fighter, Phil Klein. He dropped murders over 25% in like one year. Brilliant. His one of his his one weakness, I thought, was that he didn't really connect with the community as well as he probably should have. I mean, brought crime down. But I think because he his his theory was you can be a big enough army and I can control crime in Chicago. And and to his credit. He made incredible strides, but there was there was tension. There was a disconnect between, you know, some of the African-American communities down the south and the west side. And then I think with the police department, there had been a couple high level incidents that got national attention where the police didn't look real good. Um, so when I got there, I thought, you know what? It's been a while since they probably had a superintendent that would go out at night and go to talk to people, go down gangways. You know, just come up and talk to the average citizen on the street, try to find out what's going on. You know, what do they need? You know, what what's their biggest issue facing them? And then I thought, you know, it shouldn't just be me. So I had the entire command staff go out every Friday night. Uh, they could work a late shift, but just go out and just drive through the community and go talk to people. Now, some I didn't make it a real measured thing. Like you got to give me a list of contacts you go to. Sometimes I would call and say, Hey, I'm looking for commander. So-and-so is he still out? And they go, yeah, he's out here. So we would meet and chat a little bit. But the reason I did that, Greg, was I wanted the community to know that I cared about them. Number one, I hadn't done that in a long time. So I thought it was an opportunity to really see firsthand what goes on because Chicago can be totally different. You can see some really beautiful neighborhoods, down on the south side during the day, but then at night, everything kind of changes. And you see a lot of boys hanging around the corner. You can just almost feel there's a different vibe in the air. Um, so I want to go out and feel that. So I thought it would be a good chance to come in the communities, go to some of the little restaurants down the south side or on the west side, sit down, you know, have some, you know, jerk chicken, have some fish and chips, you know, grab a cup of coffee, 
go in a gangway to a party that folks were having and, and just kind of listen to that. And then what I would do on Saturdays, the mayor always had a function in the community and usually was in the South or the West side. Who's the and mayor then? Like, yeah, Mayor Daly. So he and I then would go talk to people and kind of carry that on. And what I realized right away was people appreciated the fact that for that moment in time, they had the mayor of Chicago, they had the superintendent of the Chicago Police Department. I would drag the district commander over and we would sit and talk to them. And if it was something that we could actually put a plan to, um, we would put that in place. Maybe we had to do like a, a special mission that we would have officers go by and check this one area. And then I'd go back and follow up. I'd say, hey, here's my phone number. Give me a call if it's, it, it, tell me how this works. I said, but let me have your phone number so I can check on you. And then like two weeks later, I'd come back and say, how did it work out? They said, it was really great. The guys that used to always hang around the corner, your, your cops pushed them off the corner. I said, well, great. That's what we were looking to do. So a lot of it, Greg, was building trust with the community that had been absent for a while. And the response, and I was a little bit skeptical. I didn't know how it would work. I never brought camera crews with me. I didn't make this as a, you know, a photo op. You know, some of the news people, when they heard I was doing this, wanted to ride along. I go, absolutely not. I am not using people as pawns in a video to promote what I'm doing to keep Chicago mm -hmm. safe. It was just going to be me out there talking to people. And I think a couple of times my one driver is saying, hey, you, you may not want to do this. I said, that's why I got you, my brother. Uh, keep me out of trouble. Make sure nothing bad happens. So uh, we never had an issue. And people were incredibly polite and just appreciative of the fact that I took time out of my day to go down and talk to them. But you got to have that follow up. If somebody gives you something, it's like, OK, you're going to see me out here next week and you're going to see me out here the week after that. And I will make sure that the area, that corner you're concerned about is going to be cleaned up. I give you my word. And then when you do that, you know, that buys a lot of goodwill in the community. It's like, hey, man, the superintendent came out here. He told me he was going to do this. And hey, look, you can check. These boys are not hanging around the corner. They're not playing dice. You know, that area has been cleaned up. Now, to be fair, it may have moved to another part of that of that community. But at least I took care of that problem at that one particular place. That's right. That's good. That's good. That's good. Because as, as we always say on Leadership Factory Podcast, if it's not on paper, it's vapor. So I want to make sure everybody's got their pen and paper writing these nuggets and bombs that you're dropping. Because you're trying to decriminalize an area through building relationships. Everybody that's listening is probably not doing that, or maybe they are, I don't know. But they're just trying to get people to take another step, get people to show up for work, get people to learn and grow and do the job they're asked without creating a problem. Okay. And if you can go meet them to try to decriminalize the area. So everybody listening today, if you would just go spend some time with people, stop, which is spend time on people, you could take some anxiety away from someone. And that's going to build trust. And trust is going to be the electricity to the inspiration. Because without trust, you don't have anything. And right. another thing, a powerful thing you said, you followed up. You're making them a believer. Because if you don't follow up, they're not going to, they'll trust you less than they were when you came down there. Because you just, like you said, I didn't come down there for a photo shoot to get some press and run in a campaign, a political campaign. I came down there to genuinely love on people. And you showed them that. And they bought into you once you came back and followed, hey, tell me how we're doing. So you know, tell me how we're point. doing. I kind of started doing that as soon as I got kind of out of into career world. When I was in the army, you know, people always report to you. I was usually in a command position and, you know, everybody wants to tell you what you want to hear. So as soon as I got done with the morning briefings, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to go down to the maintenance building or I'm going to go down here. I'm going to go down there. And you just walk up and you start talking to people. Now, to be fair, it made some of the midline supervisors extraordinarily nervous uh, because now they have me <laughs> going down there and asking a lot of questions. But you know, the reason I did that is I wanted to hear what can I do to give you what you need to do your job better? I mean, I've always viewed it as any leadership position. I'm not in it for me. I'm in it for you, the employee. I'm in it for you, the soldier. I'm in it for you, the agent. I'm in it for you, the cop. You know, I'm not in it for me, the police chief or the captain or the lieutenant or whomever. I'm in it for you. And I always felt my responsibility was to give them what they need. Well, if I'm not talking to people, any information I get is going to be filtered. Because some people will say, no, we don't want to say we need that. So I go, tell me what you need. I may not be able to give it to you, but let me try. 
And if I can't give it to you, I'm going to tell you, I can't do that. Uh, this, and I'll tell you why I can't do that. But you know what? I've always found that the people that are actually doing the job usually have the best ideas how to do it better. And uh, they're not they're not chained by this. Well, that's the way we've always done it. You know, because, well, didn't we just hire you? Yes. So how did you do it where you came from? Well, we did it this way. I like it. Let's try it. Because you can always go back. But just have the have the courage to try something to make it better for people. Um, when I was in Chicago Police Department, you know, uniform issue was it just made no sense to me. And I said, can't we make uniforms that are a little more functional? I mean, I'm, my background is the military and, you know, you wear these uniforms. They're not they're not really functional. They don't help you do your job. You're wearing this body armor underneath your shirt. It's hot. Um, it's bulky. You can't really re release it real early. It's easy if you want to cool down a little bit. Have we thought about putting body armor on the outside. And if you have body armor on the outside, maybe we should make it so you can carry stuff on it. So you could put pockets in it and you could put simply put your name on it. And here's an idea which blew my mind that they didn't have. How about if we embroider in bright letters, police on the back of it. So when you're chasing somebody down the street, the people behind you will recognize that you're the police rather than perhaps just another criminal or offender that you're chasing, which maybe just maybe might keep you from getting shot or injured um, because they know you're the police. And I looked at some of the things that I saw. It's like, in many ways, the department was an incredible department, but in some ways, because they had not had a lot of outsiders, it, it, they were just living in the past, decades, decades in the past. So uh, we worked hard on bringing new modern things into their, into their way of work, which would help them help them do a better job. Uh, little things, uh, give them a little more flexibility. Um, nobody liked to wear the, the, the crown hats because if you lost this one particular shield, it was an automatic three-day suspension. So I said, hey, the hats look awesome. I think they look fantastic, but maybe we ought to just wear those like for graduations, funerals, recruitment ceremonies, kind of a ceremonial. How about how would guys feel about wearing baseball hats? Oh, we'd love that. Or how about in the wintertime when it's really cold, what about a knit cap? Oh, we'd love that. I said, well, why don't we try that? Kind of make it like That's a awesome. utility uniform. Right. And just little things like that, you know, those were well received. And it was simple things. Um, but, but I think it's important but, to get to know. And I did the same thing in the community by going out and talking to them. Like, how are you guys with the police? Oh, we hate the police. Well, why? Well, this happened. I said, can you give me a time reference? Well, like, what do you mean? Did it happen last month? Well, no, it, it happened like when I was 12. Okay, you're 42 now. Can we say that the people during that time 30 years ago probably aren't here? And if you'll give me that much, can we say this can be a fresh start? Well, okay, how many superintendents came down and talked to you at 1230 at night? None. I said, okay, so I've taken the first step. So can you promise to work with me and see if we can, uh, if we can build these relationships a little bit? Okay, but then as you just mentioned, you gotta have that follow-up. You can't just go down there one night and they never see you again. So I had kind of my little routine, my route that I would go. And the other thing that was interesting, Greg, was you can make it more personal. It was great being in your police car, you know, in your expedition driving up. But the best interaction I had was when my driver, who then turned into my bicycling partner, we would just ride bikes throughout the south and west sides. And I was amazed, not having been a police officer, how being on a bicycle just built relationships. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. You weren't behind the glass of a car. You weren't in this 4,000 pound thing that you're driving around in. You were right there with the people and people were friendly. They were very interactive. And that was a real eye-opening experience to me. So I really tried to beef up the bike units and say, hey, go out and ride through the community. It's a great way to show that, you, that you're here for them. And, and I would never have known that if I just didn't one time say, hey, can one ride bikes to the community? And they're like, you're you're not serious, are you? I said, yeah, I'd like to see how it is. And um, it's so good. It was it was actually very eye opening. That's good. Wow, that's so man, you just dropped the button. Basically, you gave a MBWA class 101 managed by wandering around. Yeah, I've done that my whole life, Greg. Just, it? I mean, well, where did where everywhere. like where did you learn that from? Who taught you that? Somebody model that for you? I think it's just something I picked up. Maybe curiosity. You know, and, and plus, I hate sitting in an office. I despise that. And uh, some guys like to sit there and some gals like to sit there. You're at your throne. And, you know, if it was Game of Thrones, it'd be the Iron Throne. And everybody comes to you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I despise that. 
I absolutely hate that. I'd much rather see what's going on. So is that a curiosity sometimes? You know, when I was a young lieutenant, part of what I was responsible for was a missile repair facility. Well, I knew nothing about that. So I'd be like, hey, I'm going down to the, to the maintenance facility. And they're like, are you going to call them? I said, no, I'm just going to go walk around and see what they're doing. And I would oftentimes do that. And just like with the cops, I'd walk up and say, so what's going on? They'd go, no, oh, oh, you know, then there's a bit of a reaction. I said, I'm just asking you, man to man, just tell me, like, what's going on? What, what are you happy about? What are you pissed off about? You know, what can I do to make your world better? You know, besides retire or leave, you know, give, give me something I can actually do. But I just have always found that to be very helpful so I can kind of understand. So then you, you can kind of see if like some of the managers are coming to you and they're telling you something and you're like, you know, I was just down at your unit the other day. I'm, I'm not sure I'm feeling that because they oftentimes will want to tell you things that they think you want to hear. Funny story. When I went to Philadelphia, I had, I had, a, I had like four ASAC assistant special agent in charge underneath me. I knew, I knew one of them very, very well. And my predecessor was a good guy, but he did not want to hear problems. So I go in and talk to them. They're like, whatever, whatever you want, boss, whatever you want. I said, no, 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 I'm asking you guys, help, help me, help me understand what we've got going on here. No, it's all good. Everything's good. And, and so I, I came up with this one really stupid proposal. It was to move everybody around in the office. Like if you were a white collar crime supervisor, you were going to go on gangs. And I was going to do it kind of the big bang approach all at once as a surprise. And then I've tried to feign, like I was really excited about this. I go, man, I've been thinking about this for weeks. I'm so excited to tell you about this. And I go through this and, and the one guy who did not know me at all, he's just staring at me. And he goes, can, can we speak honestly? I said, well, of course. He goes, that's the most ridiculous plan I've ever heard. And he starts going off and I just started clapping. I said, thank you. I said, it took me all weekend to come with something so stupid, so outrageous that would finally make you tell me that what I was thinking about was totally screwed up. Now we can have these honest discussions because this is what I want from all of you. Tell me if you've got a problem with what you're talking about. Tell me where I'm wrong. Tell me, because I said, if you don't do that, I don't need any of you. If I, if I can just play the role of the dictator and just come out and issue edicts all day, right. I can save the government and the American taxpayer for pretty good salaries. So I said, the only thing I ask is this, we can yell and holler and curse at each other in this room but when the doors open we got to be singing the same song so we've got to be unison is, is that fair and they're like yeah that's fair i said can we can we agree on that yes promises yes and to their credit my time in philadelphia was pretty good and we'd have we'd have some spirited discussions but then it's like okay well we're kind of split in my role i have to make the final decision so this way we're going to go I said, sorry, guys, I know that doesn't make you happy. And they'll go, no, it's okay. We just wanted to voice our opinions. And I said, you know what? If it doesn't work, we'll change it. Nobody's going to die from this. Yeah, my my first boss at Avert Express, and I'm I'm high volume intensity at this point. And he, yeah. he's the guy that's trying to pull me off, pull pull me back, right? And, and, and he would scold me. He would discipline me. You know, he'd talk to me hard. Then he'd see my shoulders, my body be deflated because, you know, I'm in trouble, right? And he'd go, listen, before you leave, be you. I want you to be you. But sometimes you just got to slow down. And you got to go at everybody else's pace. See, you you slow down. And you got on their page. Got on their pace. See, I didn't learn probably to slow down and get on people's pace until I was probably 42, 43, 44. And, and I still struggle with it, but I'm so much more aware. So that helps me be intentional with my behavior. Because I know I, sometimes I just got to stop. And I got to spend time with my wife or I got to stop. And I got to go spend time with a customer or I got to stop and spend time with my sons or my grandsons. Because that's how you connect with people. Right. I, love is spelled T-I-M-E. And that's just stop. We just got to stop. Put your phone away. Stop looking at social media. Quit worrying about what's going on in the world. Find a relationship with someone, go spend some time with them and ask questions. So your curiosity changed things. You know, the other and thing. You tore, Greg, you tore I, those silos down of fear where someone could have the freedom to talk. That's powerful. Because if you can get people, if we can get people in America to sit down out of just respect and honor one another and have a conversation without getting mad at each other, change the world. Yeah, I would at times, 
I would love to know why some people feel certain ways and, you know, without getting into specific politics, but why do you feel that way? And I'm not judging you. I just want to know, help me understand. Sadly though, you know, the discourse is so high right now, it immediately turns into personal attacks and then nothing is successful. You know what helped me out one day? I was a brand new second lieutenant. I worked with this major I really liked, Major Ackles. Interesting guy, did like big game hunting in uh, in Africa. And we were talking about, you know, how you know people can frustrate you and stuff. He said, do you like baseball? I said, yeah, I've played it my whole life. He said, you know what? Not everybody's a 300 hitter. I said, Okay, that's fair. But he said, you know what? Maybe they're a really good fielder or maybe they're a really good base runner. He goes, it is your job as a leader to put the right people in the right places and to get the most out of them. You can have a winning team without everybody hitting 300. He goes, you have nine guys, they can all hit 300. If they can't field, if they can't run, you're going to lose every game. So he said, you've got to get that blend. And some people may just be awesome. And your job is to get the most out of them that they can give, not knowing that not, not everybody's created equal. And that always kind of stuck in my head because it's like, okay, this guy's maybe not the best case agent. He's not somebody you're going to turn over a major uh, drug trafficking organization to. But maybe he's a guy that's really good about covering leads. So you know what? Leads sometimes can be a pain in the butt. You know, you're working hard. All of a sudden I go, hey, Greg, this came in from Jacksonville. Could you go out and run this down? And you're rolling your eyes like, I got some big cases to work. But some guys and gals are very happy, like, hey, give it to me, I'll do it. And they go out and they do a great job. They just were better suited at those quick turnarounds. And you know what? If I've got guys and gals that can do that, and then I've got a couple guys that are really into making the big cases, I've got a very good team. And um, sometimes you have to defend some of these guys on inspections a little bit because it's a senior agent. And they say, well, he doesn't have any major cases. I said, that's true. But we've taken the team concept here. Look at his lead turnaround time. Look at how fast he processes it. And most of the inspectors that I dealt with, they're like, you know what? You make this work and um, you get the most out of your people. So you know what? We're writing you up as you're all good. I said, thank you. I appreciate that. But to me, it's like finding, putting the people in the position where they can succeed. And I think that's hard sometimes because like you, you're, you're very all forward all the time. And I, you probably in the, your younger years thought like everybody should be running at your pace. But they may have family issues. They may have a lot of different issues that, that they want to run at your pace. You might inspire them to run at your pace, but they just can't. They just you can't. Know? And it's it's sad, but then you got to sit back and go, okay, he or she's given me everything they've got. They're doing a good job. They're taking care of their family. They've got their responsibilities there. They're giving me an honest day's work. I'm okay with that if they're only hitting 225, even though you want them to hit 300. That's right. That's so good. You just get... Coach, your second class, you just gave finding the uniqueness of the person. And how do you tap into the uniqueness of that person? Because what we do, it takes people to do it. Whatever we do, you, you can take AI, chat, GPT, it takes people. At the end of the day, it's about relationship. It you got to know how to deal with people. And Greg, I think you've hit on this before. It, it, you know, I've worked for some bosses and I've had some colleagues. They they want to be liked. You know, it's like, well, I'm not going to do that because then people won't like me. It's like, no, no, they, they, not everybody wants you as their friend. They want you as someone who has integrity and mm -hmm. someone that will make a decision. I, there was a there was a special agent in charge out in Phoenix. He's passed away. And he was getting blasted on an inspection for the uh, climate survey. He wasn't nice. He was kind of a jerk. He was aggressive. He didn't say good morning to you sometime. So they called me up and they said, what do you think about him? I said, the single best boss I've ever had in the FBI. And the guy that's interviewed me goes, no, are you serious? I go, no, because I said, he was always a man of his word. And he always gave me an answer when I needed one. I said, no, I'm not the type of person that runs him for everything. Like, you know, you know, mother, may I do this? But when I needed an answer, he always gave me one. And for me, that's all I needed. They go, well, did he say good morning to you? I said, no. And I didn't say good morning to him. I didn't need to. I wanted a guy who would make a decision for me and he was available. And I said, you guys make a big fuss about him, how mean he was. And you loved his predecessor. His predecessor never had a function in his house. The guy you think is this big jerk. He had parties for his house for all the support staff. He had it for the SWAT teams. He had it for different squads and they did something good. Nobody talks about that. Because maybe in the morning he's thinking about something, he's got a lot of things on his mind, and he didn't say good morning when you walked in. Yeah, would it be nicer if he would? Yeah. Is that a big thing to do? No. 
But you know what? That to me is all secondary stuff. That's just that's just stuff. I it's nice to have a person you really like. If it's your boss or your colleague, you like that. But you also want to have somebody that's competent, get the job done, and is there for you when you need them. Not to say good morning, but like, hey, I've got a big problem, Greg. I I, I need your help. And you go, you, you you put your take glasses off, say, how can I help you? You know, and and that's the type of relationship I've always tried to build with people. Uh, is like, if you need me for real, I'm here for you. And I don't care day or night. Yeah, I had an older gentleman than me worked for me for like six years when I owned my own trucking company. And because <laughs> most, because I'm very quick to shoot. Because I'm, I mean, I was probably one of the worst listeners, which I'm so much better now. Because if I want to inspire someone, if I don't listen to them to understand and set a reply, they'll never trust me. So therefore, I can't inspire. Well, this one guy was just looking for integrity. He knew I had integrity, but he said one thing about me. If you have a business problem with Greg, he's very brash and he's very quick to answer to get on with the decision. But if you had a personal problem, well, he'd sit there and talk to you for three or four hours about your personal problem. And when I looked at him, I said, do I do that? He said, yeah, I know if I have a personal problem that I'll, you will sit there and listen and try to help me figure out the most wise thing to do. <laughs> he laughed. He said, he said, yeah. But if we got a business problem, he just looks at me like, are you stupid? You can't fix that. <laughs> Why are you asking me this question? That's how I made people feel. Cause, cause it was different. So I'm a little bit like that guy, not all the way, but we all, we're all different. Then it, it's at some point, it's like I had to look in the mirror one day and go, what kind of leader do you want to be? And I had one of my mentors at Avery Express draw that out of me. So Greg, what type of leader do you want to be? When he asked me that, I was probably 27, 28 years old. He said, go around and look at all your leaders you've had, good, bad, and ugly, and you pull the good stuff, and you develop your own leadership stuff. So in my uh, Take Another Step System, an inspirational leadership workshop, we do leadership legacy, and we go through five people of impact, and, and what did you know, see, and feel about them, and how did they inspire you? Then we'll write your own leadership legacy based on what's already inside of you, that someone's already modeled for you. That someone made you feel great when they did that. So why don't you do that? Right. If that made you feel bad, well, don't do that to people. You know, you've raised such a good, this is a really interesting point. Back when I was at FBI headquarters in the human resource division, we had a consulting company come in and they looked at how we promoted people to like mid-level management and right above the agents. And we really didn't have a good program. It's kind of, you raise your hand, and you get promoted. So we 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 wanted to have some type of evaluation program. And it was fascinating because you'd have role players and you'd go through this. And so many people, they reverted back to what they had experienced, even knowing it was wrong. And a couple of people called me up and said, hey, I understand I failed this thing. I said, well, let me let me take a look at it. And I said, I'll get back with you. So I'd play the tape and I, I'd make some notes. And I said, hey, I listened to the tape. And they said, what'd you think? I said, you know, I, I, I think you kind of missed the mark. And uh, I said, but here's why. And I said, why did you do this? And, and this, uh, this one person goes, because that's how everybody's always treated me. I said, but did you think that was right? He goes, well, I was kind of nervous. So I figured I'd revert back to what I knew. I go, well, that's a whole other problem that we need to address with maybe some of our current supervisors. But um, a perfect example of this, there was a call. The scenario was this. You were on surveillance and the target you were watching was taken off. You didn't know that there was going to be a search warrant the next day and you were going out doing some reconnaissance, getting some photographs of the house. But all of a sudden, see, you see them loading up the house and you call on the radio to your supervisor and then the supervisor, you got to kind of give them a report and some recommendations what to do. And the role player in this, the person was the supervisor. Like what actions did he give to this agent who called in with this problem? So this really good friend of mine, uh, he calls up and he's like really angry because he flunked. And I said, let me look at this. So I, I go back and I listen to it. I'm just, I'm shaking my head. I call him back up. I said, okay, um, you chewed out the agent for calling on the radio because you thought that was operational security violation. 
Did you truly think that was the point of this exercise? Well, the person was an idiot. They called on the radio. They should have gone to a payphone and called in. I said, you realize the thrust of this was what were you going to tell the agent to do in that time? And it, was, and it was wide open. You could have said, hey, go get the locals, do a car stop, you know, follow them. There was really no, there wasn't a really set answer. There were several of them. But he picked one that nobody even ever thought of, that you would harass the agent, chastise the agent because the person called you on the radio. And I said, I, I don't know what to say. I understand what you're saying, but I'm going to say that was not a good call. So he got mad at me and it's like, I'm sorry, I, I can't do this. But then somebody said, and I felt bad about that because I really didn't like him. And then one of my colleagues said, would you want him running a squad? I go, good point. Good point. Yeah. But you know, when it's a friend of yours, Greg, you hate, you hate oh, doing okay. something that's basically going to drive a stake through his heart to move up in the organization. But then you also kind of think, Maybe moving up and being a leader is not the right step for everybody. And maybe you actually, although it was painful at the time, perhaps you prevented something much worse down the road. So, you know, you, you try to rationalize a little bit, but it still hurts when it's somebody that you really like and you basically wow. stop them from achieving what they wanted to do. Okay. And they don't, a lot of times they don't want to hear why you did it. They're just mad at you, but oh, well, I'll take it over it after a while. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, when we, yeah, sometimes when we speak, Life into people, the correction, they rebel against us. But I, I I love you so much. Discipline is done properly when it's done out of love, a motive. So when I discipline my sons, they've got to feel that I love them. And that's in a relationship because they got to know I, I love you so much. You can't keep doing what you're doing. But yeah. if you want to get mad at me, that's on you. I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at your behavior. You, as a person, you're special. My And my mom did a great job separating the person and the behavior because she didn't throw me out with the baby water, with the dishwater. I mean, she kept me. She threw my baby behavior away. Then when that behavior came back, she dealt with that again. But yeah. we're right back in here again. <laughs> same thing, same bat channel, same time, because you won't buy your behavior. So she kept telling me, Greg, you can't fix it until you own it. You keep deflecting to the people. That's why we're right back in here again. So therefore, you're going to be disciplined again. But I love you. You're better than this. God didn't create you to do this. There's so much more for you, but you will be disciplined. Right. And, and it's it's hard for you to understand that at that time, but that was an act oh. of love. She could easily just wash her hands of you and said, you know what? I'm done with you. But she didn't because she loved you. Uh, we're winning down here, Coach. Last question. What would you say to someone who, do, who does not see a need to build a relationship with their, I'm going to say a word I'd hate saying, subordinate, or a teammate that reports to you? That they don't want to build a relationship? They, they don't see a need in building a relationship with someone. Boy, that's a, it's shocking that somebody would actually feel that way. If you know, it's that old saying, if you take care of your people, your people will take care of you. Um, if you're just working by yourself all the time, or maybe you've just got one person underneath you, maybe you can get by with that. But as you move up in an organization, you have got to be able to delegate. And how do you know if you can delegate? If you don't have a relationship with people, you're not going to feel comfortable delegating work to them because at the end of the day they may do the work but you have the responsibility for that work um i've just started working with a small firearm company uh it's called guardian training and consulting started with a husband and wife great people and um, we've been working to grow that and try to expand a little bit and the one of the founders uh, the husband he's like you know this is hard this is what karen and i did and it's just so hard letting go. And I said, well, Josh, first thing, you got to know your team. You brought everybody on here and you trust us, right? He goes, I do. I do. But and I said, you've got to have those relationships. You've got to feel 100% comfortable when I'm teaching a particular class. I may do it differently than you, but it's going to be done as well as you. And you won't know that until you get to see what I do and understand what I'm doing. And I said, it's still going to be hard because this is your baby. But I said, you will never take this to the next level if you're teaching 
just basic courses all the time. You need to be going out and selling this. You know, you need to get the contract with LAPD or NYPD or the Los Angeles Sheriff's Office that you're going to come in and totally revamp their firearms program. Teach these officers how to shoot really fast and really accurate. Give them training that they've never seen before. But if you're teaching something as basic as concealed carry or use of force simulation, which are they're basic courses, they're important courses, but that's not building the business. So I've tried to really work with him and mentor him. And um, he's he's doing a great job with it. His wife is actually, I think, is better at seeing that big picture. Um, but, you know, he's also torn and fighting that that desire. He likes to shoot and he likes to be on the range and he likes to do this stuff. And I said, you know what? Sometimes you got to back off that and let us do that. But it's the whole thing of know your team, get to know your people, because if you don't, you will never feel confident. You'll never trust them um, to to go in and do the work that you have to have them do. I mean, so I, the more you move up in an organization, you might have, you, you know, you could, well, like at Chicago Police Department, I had like 13 and a half thousand people. You think I could actually do their work for them? No, I had to have relationships. Now, did I know all 13 and a half thousand? Of course not. Did I know all their commanders? Yes. Did I know all the deputy chiefs? Yes. Did I come in and have conversations with them? I just call up and say, Hey, um, can I come by and see you at your office? Do you have time? Well, of course, the answer is yes. Uh, but I would just come in and talk and they'd be all have they'd have their binders. Like, what do you want to talk about, boss? I go, really? I want to talk about you. What? I want to talk about you. And I want to get to know you as a person. I got to know, are you the next person who's going to be in the superintendent police department? Are you ready for that position? If you're not ready for that position, what can I do to help you get ready for that position? Because all of you should be exp aspiring to be in that job. I mean, would you like to be superintendent? Oh yeah. I said, so do you feel you're ready right now? Well, probably not. I said, okay, we have a gap. How can I help you fill that gap? And uh, they had never had anybody come in and ask that. And I, I asked why there was a black guy who I really liked and he comes up and I say, help me understand. He said, this is kind of a black expression, but he said, you ever heard the term bucket of crabs? And I go, not really. He said, what do crabs do? If they're in a bucket, one's trying to climb out, other one's going to reach out and pull it back. And I said, really? He said, anybody that looks to be a superstar, that looks to be moving up, will be viewed as a threat. And I said, no, no, come on. That's the person you should be grooming for future, you know, future leadership roles. And he just started laughing. He goes, you are like so foreign to this agency because anybody else in your seat would look at us as a threat. He goes, I'm kind of a creative guy. There's been a brick put on my head for like the past five years because I'd have some ideas. The mayor might ask me about it. The Your predecessors would find out about, about it and they'd say, bury him. And I said, why? Because wow. he said, I was viewed as a threat. I go, wow, that is. I said, well, the good news is we got to change that culture. The bad news is that ain't going to happen overnight because I'm guessing that a lot of the bosses that's kind of permeated down to and they all feel that way. He goes, 100%. So that was one of my endeavors. Um, I don't know how successful I was at that because there's just too many and I wasn't there long enough. But um, you've got to know your people underneath you. And when you see talent, you got to develop that talent. And I've always looked at, I got to find the person to replace me because I could get out here, I get bit by a rattlesnake. Um, I could have a heart attack. And if I haven't done a good job of finding a successor, then I've pretty much failed as a leader. That's good. That might be the name of this episode, Find My Replacement. I, I personally feel that we should all be doing that. When we're in key oh, leader, find my replacement. I, I call it working myself out of a job. Exactly. Every promotion I got at my first company, I worked myself out of a job, and I started doing a job they gave me the promotion to. Yep. And one it's of the like owners crazy. I worked for, he said, Greg, until you do really good here, and you show me that you can do the, the, your next step up, to an executive from a VP, you got to be be able to do both of those jobs at the same time. I said, I'm game. Let's grow with it, dude. <laughs> and the people that don't want to do that, just take a step back. Somebody else yep. is coming that wants yep. it more than you. So man, thank you so that. much, man. Great information. It, here's just some things. Find my replacement. I want to talk about you. That That's powerful. Know your team. How can I help you fill that gap? Don't create a culture where it's a bucket of crabs. Yeah. I got to give I, you I, one more good line, brother. Okay. Go ahead. I learned the other day. Always a student, sometimes a teacher. Uh-oh. Always a student. Sometimes a teacher. 
That's good. I've been a firearms instructor with in Illinois, firearms instructor with the FBI. I came out here in Arizona, you know, tried to say, hey, I, I can always learn something. And I did. I learned a lot of cool stuff that I did not know. And the guy teaching me goes, man, I thought you were going to be like a real jerk and kind of a know-it-all. I said, absolutely not. And I said, I, I am always a student. Sometimes I have to teach, but I'm always a student. And even when I teach sometimes, I usually can pick something up from the students. So he loved that. He just loved that approach. And you, uh, that's one I, of our mottos. In my Take Another Step System Inspirational Leadership Workshop, that is trait number 10 of an inspirational leader, lifelong learner. Because it, like the 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 COO at Avid Express said when I worked there, it's if you're not growing, you're dying. Hundred percent. So write that domino effect down that I've challenged you with. Make sure you can find one thing out of this episode that'll catapult you forward in your inspirational leader career, inspirational leadership career. So Jody, thank you, sir. You're amazing. We just had the uh, the Bobcat and Snake Show that we've talked about for the last twelve years. So. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you again. And and listeners, listen to what he said today. He dropped a lot of nuggets that's going to help you get that next promotion. So thank you, Jody. Go have a great day. And as we say here at Leadership Factory Podcast, let's grow.